What's going on, everybody? Welcome to the Dig It Podcast. I'm your host, Drew Walsh. And today we got special guest David Coggins in the house of PFA and Pocket Path. David Coggins, someone who I've come across. I've never met Coach David, but he's someone I've followed for years and has a has a really big influence in the baseball, especially the throwing world. Um, and he's I've been able to learn so much just watching you from afar. And today we're going to uncover so many things from pitching, from throwing, from just youth development. So, David, welcome to the Dig It Podcast. If you could, you've been in the game for a while, all right? So if you could just take us down the timeline, you know, your involvement in baseball, um, after baseball, and then how you got to where you are today. Yeah, yeah. Appreciate you having me on the uh, podcast as well. Of so, course. Yeah. And I might have to grab some water every now and again. I'm just biting off a little cold, so hope I don't sound bad. But We're good to go. Yeah, the first, um, you know, I grew up a multi-sport kid, you know, we'll probably talk a little bit about that. I was a football player, soccer player, baseball player. Football was sort of my main sport all the way through high school. Uh, <clears throat> although baseball, I probably did the most with that and soccer. And then once I um, got to high school, sort of developed into a better quarterback than I was baseball player. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> and ended up uh, signing to go to Clemson to play football. One second. Like a rough day to do a podcast. You're so fun. Like I said earlier, we're going raw on cut here. So that the cool. listeners have to deal with it. <laughs> yeah. So so you know, from there went went to um into my senior year, that football scholarship, and then ended up um having a really good senior season and then ended up getting drafted in the first round of the Phillies and then signed, skipped college and went to uh, Pro Ball. <clears throat> and then I spent a few years in Pro Ball, had an injury, shoulder surgery. Um, rehab that, then made the big league team in uh, 99. And then once I uh, spent a couple years there, had a shoulder injury again. So I couldn't, you know, basically tried to rehab that. <clears throat> couldn't come back from that. Ended up stopped playing, got into coaching, and and then started to realize that that was sort of my passion. And then that's where I am today is coaching. That's awesome. So you played b baseball and football, your two primary sports in high school? Yeah, and soccer. Yeah, I was a pretty good athlete as far as like being able to translate to each sport. Uh, had opportunities to go play college in both soccer, baseball and football. And uh, just ended up kind of <clears throat> because of the in just because of the workload and injuries. By the time I was junior and senior, I had to give up one of the sports, which, you know, soccer would be the one. Uh, and then stayed with the baseball and, and football and, and then uh, ended up just because of I had a, a, a MCL surgery or not surgery, MCL injury and in football my my uh, senior year. So that kind of played a role in kind of my decisions based off the next you know couple of years, seeing how, you know, did I really want to risk football and and kind of catastrophic injury. And then so I had to, to make sure that I, you know, chose wisely. So I chose baseball and then you know, ironically, I had a lot of injuries in baseball, too. So it's just different injuries. <laughs> so um, but that got me to where I am now today, because starting PFA was more about uh, training side of things, physical training. <clears throat> and then just seeing how that was developing, how I was able to see, OK, that's making guys one part of their sort of equation. Um, guys were getting better, getting stronger. But the another part of the equation was just the way they were moving and the efficiency. I was learning about how the body moves. So um seeing how poorly the guys were throwing i started to kind of go all right let's put these both together get stronger throw more efficiently all of a sudden you know not, not a not a rocket science there but you know these guys got really good hey i know it's not rocket scientist coach but there's so 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 much magic within those two realms right i think you know, for I'm blessed to have a background, my undergrad and grad are in kinesiology because I'm, you know, I love the body. I love anatomy. I love how it moves. I'm fascinated by it. And I'm obsessed with infield play. And I, I that, you know, there's two different lenses we see movers from. Right. So we have a, a the athlete as a just a level change, a mover from an athletic side. And then we have a tactical skill side. And there's a huge gap between those depend. And usually at the younger age, especially so. I think, you know, some some uh, athletes do a great job and take care of both. But then there's also a disconnect between the communication about, hey, what are you working on in the gym? Are you working ankle hip mobility, working uh, lumbar st uh, stability, T-spine mobility on the mound? Hey, Coach Dave, what are you working rear side drop? You know, and they never talk. And you guys have created from what I've seen something really cool and special within the four walls 
of PFA, right? So right. That, I think that trend that lost in translation from the, the strength and conditioning side to the field side, there, there's a lot that we're missing out on. If you, if you want to kind of pick, uh, pick up where I left off and just talk about your experience with that. Yeah, that was, you know, that interestingly enough, like when, when we first opened up 10 plus years ago, the, um, the players obviously were getting better, but they had a lot of time to come in. So they were training two, three days a week, lifting weights, good program that was based off rotational athletes that I had, you know, created myself, but also uh, had a good, really good influencers. I, I spent time with Eric Cressy in um, Connecticut. I spent time with um, uh, Todd Durkin down in San Diego, runs Under Armour. Um, and I spent time with Tom House in uh, USC working for them. So I had I had like, I did my homework, you know, to try to figure out what was the best kind of formula for a program. And at the time, there really wasn't a whole lot around. It was mostly just typical football based or you go lift on your own. So the um, challenge was, though, as we kind of had lots of success and, and a lot of the best players were training here and a lot of the best players that were playing travel ball was that teams now the travel ball world started to get bigger. And then they started to get very competitive on. Uh, you know, getting players. And then that meant that, hey, you know, come to our travel ball program because we have a Wednesday night field, you know, and no other travel ball team really did field then. It just did really weekend games and you do what you wanted to do. Um, <clears throat> so then that team, of course, had a lot of success. Uh, so another team comes in, comes in the, you know, the area, we got another field. Hey, we got batting cage. And then all of a sudden, before you know it, these travel ball teams were taking the time during the week of all these kids of, of uh, two or three days during the week. So now they had to, do their programs, which were really suboptimal programs, but they didn't have a choice. Right. So it kind of made me kind of change also my model here at PFA is that we didn't have any teams for a long time, never did, because I wanted to be that neutral place that players could come to not feel threatened or the coaches feel threatened. But that just changed because they they were threatened by outside sources and then they were parents were having to choose what do we take away? Well, strength training is not something that just sees overnight, you know, effects, you know, you might change a kid's throwing arm action or a swing and all of a sudden, boom, he's better, but lifting t takes time, you know, so they were kind of getting rid of that bad recipe. That That's a great story. When did, when did you make the decision to start a PFA, the, the travel program side, when we, was that part uh, of your business established? That was probably about four years ago, you know. All right, so very recent, right? And then you had yeah. that whole pandemic thing that happened. Yeah, that's so right. I'm sure that actually, was a curveball. Right, a year before pandemic, uh, we started those teams. So yeah, that was definitely a curveball. But it gave us the opportunity to now set their schedule to make their no choice. You have to come work out. Like you, that part of your membership is Monday night and Wednesday night in the gym, Tuesday, and you know, then we'll combine it because we have cages, so you can get both things going on at the same time. So it was a much better formula for them to at least get workouts in. And, and like, like I knew it would, it took time, you know, it was a little rough in the beginning because, you know, kids, uh, they didn't want to do it. They're lazy, uh, all this stuff. But we had a couple core teams <clears throat> that were probably like in sixth grade, seventh grade, right around there, who now are eighth grade, ninth grade freshmen. And that team is a bunch of studs because they stuck with it. And now they're bigger than all the other kids. They're, you know, more athletic. So that's that's been cool to watch. And then, of course, that's just been our models to try to get kids to, to realize how important that part is. <clears throat> and um, yeah, and it's and I'm glad we did it. I was, I was reluctant to do it because I just I didn't I, you know, I tried to be neutral, like I said, but yeah, <laughs> things changed. <laughs> it's almost impossible to be neutral. Um, I speak for myself with fast development. We train in fields on a daily basis and I get asked all the time. Hey, want to coach with this travel? You want to stop? No, 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 I'm just going to stay over here. I'm going to rent the field. I'm going to train infielders. And, and that's that. But you were in a position like, listen, it's either I do this or the kids are going to get pulled in 15 different ways. The yeah. parents are already uber stressed out. I, I love that because I hear, I, you know, I listen to a lot of the parents and I think they're superheroes, how they're able to get their kids to three different practices for just baseball. And then maybe they play another sport, I hope. But then they got to go to their catcher, their pitcher, their infield, um, and their hitting coach mm -hmm. outside of that. And then they have this thing called school. So it's like, wow, <laughs> like we're, yeah. there's only 25 hours in a day. So you guys, mm -hmm. I love how you understood the importance of building the athlete and then saying, listen, we're just going to give you all the tools you need here in one spot. So that's amazing. That's something yeah. really special that 
man, I, I hope people hear this and are like, we got it. They're on something. We got to, we got to <laughs> figure it out. Right. I love that. What's outside of getting the athlete to buy in to strength and conditioning, to getting in the weight room. Cause listen, I understand the benefits of it. I'm all about it, but there's days where I don't want to do it. I know I have to though. Right. So for the athletes, how, how have you found success? Listen, you got to get in here and then also like stay in here. Right. Cause yeah. I know a huge obstacle is when season starts, then, you know, the decline in attendance is there. And I think that's a huge issue. Mm -hmm. No, it's for sure. And, you know, you try to develop a culture um, first, right? You want them to enjoy coming to the gym and not kind of going, oh, I got to go to the gym, you know? Um, so that's been a big feast. So whenever we have coaches here, trainers here, uh, fortunately, most of them have, have either – been a part of PFA as they were younger. So they, they know what energy I brought to them and they know the culture already. So that's been a big benefit. We have a great couple strength coaches here. Um, the, the pitching coaches that are around hitting coaches here as well. They're all guys that are former players and, and they know that, you know, it's, it's so much more, so much more valuable and so much more important for them as a coach to get the kids to enjoy coming than it is even to get them better. <laughs> so right. you know, they're, 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 some days, all, you know, it's just not going to be a good day for them. You can tell they're not going to listen, but if they can, they can walk away and, and by the end of that session, they had a great time. <clears throat> that That's going to bring them back for that other time. And now we'll get them, you know? So in the weight room is the same thing. You know, I, I didn't need, I don't need it to be black and white, perfect, you know, strict. And, you know, you got to run it this way because that's what the science says. You know, sometimes we're going to do a tug of war, some, some, some crazy, yeah. some goofy, you know, and yes, you know what I mean? I so, love that. Yeah. So they, so they're, they're, they're just like getting tricked into almost having a good, uh, a good experience there. And then that keeps them coming. And then now they're starting to see their bodies change, their performance change. You know, we get moms and dads saying, I can't, they can't fit in their jeans anymore. Their legs are getting too big or, you know, or, or he's walking around with a shirt off now in the, in the house. <laughs> I love, that I love it. The confidence is there. He's checking himself out in the mirror. That's awesome. Yeah. That reminds me of COVID, man. It was like two years of just unknown. So like you're going through these periodization cycles. You're trying to be creative. You you don't know when the call for spring training is or season. So you're keeping them. You're teetering mm -hmm. close to where you need to be for preseason um, as far as like a volume and intensity. But it's like, listen, like they're humans. They come into the same place four or five mm -hmm. times a week and do, the same, you know, it gets a little old. So, yeah. you know, we found ourselves during COVID playing spike ball, ping mm -hmm. pong, and all these crazy tournament games that we never would have done yeah. um, in a normal cycle or annual cycle. So that was fun. And I think there's a lot of merit in just play, right? Like mm -hmm. there's only so much time for these kids. And if you could introduce the element of play back in, there's so much more yeah. creativeness and buy-in and, and I think culture is developed somewhere within that as well. Mm -hmm. I think that's awesome. And if you could give just a few bullet points to any parents or players listening that are going in the season, I think your, your pro athletes understand the more mature they've seen the physical side or the, the physical approach to the game. What about the youth guys going into high school, college seasons, maybe even just, you know, a spring, spring travel, ball, like what should their focuses be right now? Yeah, the, the key for <clears throat> for them, and I think the ones, in my opinion, in the last 10 plus years, the guys in high school who um, have gone on to play college baseball, high level, gone on to continue their growth. So a lot of guys are freshman year. There's a lot of kids that are about, you know, if they're elite, there's a lot of elite. And as you get a little older, there's a little less elite, a little less elite. The guys that have always maintained that are the ones who kept it very consistent. So if they had a routine – that they came in once a week or twice a week if they went training. Even in season, they made a way to get there and, and still make it happen, still get their grades in, still get in there. Even if it was just for something light, you know, maybe it's a lot. Oftentimes during the season, pitcher-wise, our bullpens might consist of just doing medicine ball throwing on the mound. Might be just, hey, hang out, talk, and, and sit here and watch some of these other bullpens. Uh, everybody's on different different kind of wavelengths as far as what they're, they're asked to do during the week and when they're doing it. So – you know, there's there's always time to 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 do something to get yourself going forward and getting better. And I think what happens is a lot of times these kids get to that high school and then they 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 want to. I don't know if it's a right word is impressed, but they want to make sure they don't get the coach mad. They want to follow his plan. They are thinking that he has got their best interest. They're thinking that he's doing his homework. And as you know, um, 
unfortunately not too many coaches around here, um, really put the passion and energy into actually staying on top of what's new or, you know, giving that energy every single time out for that kid or doing what's best for him. So unfortunately kids kind of get trapped in that and then they kick out of it around June when, when the season ends and they look back and go, man, I just wasted like three months, you know, on JV or freshman or varsity, whatever it may be where I could have been continuing to get better. Um, you know, they get convinced there's, there's a, you know, baseball's got this, you know, place of <laughs> negative environment coached by negative people, you know, and, it, and it's unfortunate. It really drags a lot of people down. Or, right. And there's plenty of opportunity in, in problem baseball is there's so much opportunity for a coach to kind of like steer kids in the wrong direction because you're always going to have a bad inning. You're always going to have a bad at bad. You're always going to have, you know, it's all, it, that's just baseball. It's inevitable. And, and, and then those moments is where they get vulnerable. And some of these coaches will, you know, basically, Hey, you know what, who are you working with? Oh yeah. A lot of guys have innings like that. Uh, yeah. Why don't you come over here? You know, quit going over there, quit doing that. You got to change it up, you know, and, Unfortunately, it's all for the wrong reasons, and they don't understand that how consistency, whether you're doing good or bad, is going to be the biggest thing that I would give advice to. So if there's something that's you've been, if you if you made that freshman team and you're excited about it because you know you had a great tryout, don't forget that the the, the routines led up that from your probably two, last two solid years of doing something. Don't change them <laughs> because by the time right? you're, it might it might nip you in the butt. Coach, that was awesome. If you, what you just said is like, all right, I'm teetering up this mountain, right? I'm I'm trending up at some degree, right? And then the season starts, which that I put in all this work to get there, and then all of a sudden there's this down decline, which is just downslope of of uh of that trend now. But it was it was all built towards the most important thing, right? My performance in high school season, and I think a lot of kids just get so consumed as well with like, I gotta, I gotta do well, I gotta do well, I gotta do well, I gotta do well, I gotta perform. I don't want to be sore. I don't want to feel this way. Mm-hmm. Well, it's like, oh, all right, like you may feel like that, maybe here and there, but also just listen to your body. Like your body might want it, it might not want it, it might need more mobility, it might need some uh, strength work, and it, it needs that stuff because it's been getting that for the last three to five months. Yeah. And then you wait three months and then you, now you're feeling all bad. Oh, I haven't worked out for three months. Why even start now? I got see, summer travel ball and you're always going to be busy, but if yeah. it's a priority, you got to keep it a priority. Oh, and yeah. uh, to your point about coaches, I, I see that so often. It's tough, man. How, how do you tell a kid to navigate and not sound like yeah. <laughs> you're trying to navigate them back playing the same game. And you just hope that I you. that's why coaches just have to be incredibly honest and upfront and everything yeah. you say but you know, you're, I know everything you say has a why it has a purpose. And as, I feel like as long as you do that, I think you have, the kids will understand that this guy is not trying to BS me. He's telling me something for a reason, a purpose for my benefit. If you have a guy who who gets mad when you ask questions and, and doesn't allow you to, to learn from that standpoint, I don't know. I'd have question marks. That'd be a red flag for me. Yeah. Um, that's, that's tough, tough part of it that they have to learn. But, but yeah, like I said, but most importantly, like I've dealt with, hundreds and hundreds of D1 uh, professional players, taking them from little league all the way to the big league still playing. They all have the same, they stayed consistent. They didn't just show up, you know, and leave for six months, then show up and leave. They, they, they just, they kept it consistent. Outside of the science too, it's like that guy is going to be in between the ears, mental rocks. Yeah. Like he continued to put the work in. He hasn't stopped. Like that breeds some type of confidence, right? Yeah. So Kids who started to maybe decline, we play a game filled with a lot of failure. When you start to take off, um, you know, different parts of your game, you might start to question things at the end of the season when you need to be clutch and need to step up and perform. So it's just an all around 360 vantage point of like your approach to the game isn't just solely reps on the specific sport. There's a lot of things that go into it. And you mentioned it wasn't even physical. He came by, he watched the bullpen, he asked a few questions. He yeah. saw a, a different pitcher move in a way that he just learned. Oh, look what he did with his front side clear. Like, I kind of like that. I've been flying open a little bit. Yeah. I think I'm going to try that technique out. And that might change the course of his season. Maybe it doesn't. Who knows? But there's a chance it could happen. So it's funny how things navigate like that. Um, let's, let's, let's divert a little bit. You got something really cool that I want the listeners to hear about called Pocket Path, man. Just let's dive straight into the Pocket Path. Okay. Obviously, I think it started because your shoulder acted up. 
Uh, maybe it was the re- if you had the pocket path, that wouldn't have happened. But yeah. let's go. In, let's get into it. Yeah, pocket path is amazing. Um, so interestingly enough, um, I people ask like, why is it called a pocket? Um, years ago, when I was coaching, I first was looking at um, similarities of what the best pitchers did um, first, just as a basic foundation. So I said, well, let's go look at big leaguers throw. And then I, I was kind of walked away from that going, my God, there's just more confusion because there's so many big leaguers that do things so many different ways. <clears throat> so I thought, well, how do I narrow it down? And what I did is I thought I'll get rid of relievers and sort of that number three, four, five starter, because most of those guys, you know, are becoming relievers because of negative reasons. Like nobody right. takes a kid that's a stud number one and two starter and says, you'd be a great reliever. No, it right? doesn't work like that. It's paying too much money for that. <laughs> yeah. So, so I looked, so I narrowed it down quite a bit and then I saw like a couple trends and I saw one thing was these guys when they were younger, maybe minor leagues, college, they, they look totally different than they do now. They were more aggressive. They were wilder. Their hands were all over the place. Their gloves just, it was a much more aggressive delivery. So that was one thing that checked off the box. I said, okay, that makes sense. Because when I was told to try to see how easy I can throw hard to slow down and all these things, when I was playing, I, and I had trouble with that because I never really knew it or understood why, <clears throat> but yet I'd see Kurt Schilling throwing next to me and he just looked smooth and silky and ball would always go where he wants to go. He threw hard and all that. Then, um, the other thing I looked at is like, okay, well, what's the thing that's happening first? Well, they're landing very, very consistently. So I started to teach that to a lot of my younger kids. I want you to stick, we call it stick or landing. So when your foot hits the ground, I want you to plant and you throw and everything else rotates around that front foot. So all of a sudden, oh, they they had to fix their posture on their own. They, they started to self-correct a lot of things. But the kids that would do it really, really well, they were always the same kind. They were a kid that played middle infield. So the middle infielder always showed up, and if he wasn't already sticking his landing and throwing accurately, I just asked him to do it. He would do it. So I was like, oh, okay, well, why does he do it? Well, all middle infielders have sort of the same routine or same patterning on their throat. The ball follows the elbow, and then it comes out. So there's not a stab or aggressive ball takeaway like an outfielder would have, a pitcher would have you know, guys that maybe haven't been taught, they're just pretty aggressive and then their hands doing a lot of different things. The infielder kept everything pretty close to the body and very consistent. So that, so I started thinking, oh, okay, well, what are the routines infielders do uh, for throwing? And ironically, there weren't any because all they do is taking ground balls, they're moving around, you know, they're, they're athletic, you know, so there were, it wasn't like a school of throwing except maybe for, you know, specific guys. And right. Years ago, right? So throwing as an infielder was more just like get rid of it quick and go and get your footwork right, get your body in the position. So then I started doing that with some pitchers that were really kind of wild arm actions and wacky stuff. I started to kind of like give them double play drills, simple stuff. And I started to notice that without thinking, they were doing this and all of a sudden their body was sticking in their landing. So they were starting to kind of sync up. So I was like, okay, maybe we're onto something. And then I went back and looked at those pitchers that we talked about earlier. And I noticed that, hey, that's kind of what they did. They just, instead of the ball dominating, the elbow was leading and then they were timing their hips up. So I had a ball in my pocket, my front pocket one day when I was, I was playing catch with the guys were playing catch. I was standing next to them Threw they threw a ball, went over a head, rolled over a, uh, under a fence. So they didn't have the ball. So I, they asked me for one. So I grabbed them in my pocket. I took it out and I just threw it as Stop quick as I could. Stop it. And, <laughs> Are you kidding me? <laughs> that's exactly that's amazing. how I called it the pocket path because I had to take it out. I could not do it any other way. So the actual pocket sleeve basically guided my arm and kept it kept my hand patient until my elbow got up and I threw it right so that's how it was called the pocket come on that's good yeah, we could just stop right there us. mic <laughs> drop come on yeah, that's, that's you gotta make a movie on that that right. scene right there <laughs> yeah, I know it was funny so the um and then fast forward so I'm teaching this kind of way of teaching it's very successful making a lot of differences in a lot of people's arms and uh I have a, a gentleman come in with his son and, and he I've uh, given him lessons and he's like just blown away by how easily I was able to kind of fix his son, quote unquote, and get him to perform even better so fast. And it was just based off the simple theory of, you know, the ball, non-ball dominant throwing. And he was kind of like thinking like, dang, and he, this guy had played in Japan and, and he played in the 60, 60 uh, year old, you know, winter ball stuff in Arizona. And he was thinking about it. He's like, man, this thing works for me too, you know? And, so one night he sketched out a picture of a shirt that had 
basically sleeves, you know, sewn in on it. And he goes, Hey, you think this might work? You know, cause I was just thinking about genius. It. I was like, well, you know what? That is kind of, that's, that actually could work. So I, we started messing around with it and it had some issues uh, with it being in our shirt and it was a little harder. So then it got me thinking about some other options. And then I watched quarterback, uh, you know, being a quarterback, I realized that in those cold weather, they have that little pouch to keep their hand warm. And it just hit me one day. I was like, man, if you put the ball in that, you can take it out. And just the same theory, but you can also move it now up and down, you know, and then now we added the Velcro. So then I, I was thinking, well, I can move, if I can detach this somehow. Right. Velcro, right. And then now the Velcro was able to angle it different arm lengths, all this stuff. So it becomes very easy than just trying to put a hoodie on uh, and trying to throw. And then, yeah, that's how we did it. And I started to show videos of the prototype to some, my teammates and friends and scouts and high up, pretty really high up guys. And they're just like, Oh my God. Are you kidding me? That is the simplest, but freaking best is idea. Ever. <laughs> Isn't every best idea like scratch your head? Damn it. Like, yeah, I, dude, I, I, I did this with my kid by accident. I just didn't realize <laughs> it was so funny. Man. Yep. So take me through the sequence and like, and, and for viewers that are listening or they can't see every, every throw started middle, right? Like that, that's yeah. the biggest thing, like starting from middle, but there obviously there's, there's a sequence, kinematic mm-hmm. sequence moving after that. So take me through, like, we understand. I mean, mm-hmm. pitchers in theory have been, a lot of them have, everything is a little more circular. Like there's some kind of circular pathway to it. Yeah. Pitchers in the, in the, a lot of them have longer pathways, um, outfielders as well, but that's all changing now, right? Infielders and catchers were the only guys with shorter arm action because yeah. of time sensitivity, Right. Yes and no. I just think it's it's super dynamic. It, it and it's athletic. It's quick. Um, mm-hmm. it's rhythmic. So it's repeatable. So let let let's get to that part of it because I'm I'm fired up now, Coach. Talk to me about the sequencing after you know. Yeah. Boom. If you can envision guys, girls pulling the ball from your middle and like Coach had mentioned, like the quarterback hand warmer pulling that from mm-hmm. middle. Can you just talk about heights? Yeah. And then what comes out? Sure. So so the big theory of like okay, this thing may look at the surface that you're putting everybody in the same exact spot. But what you're, what, what I've always said is like, if you are a person who's grown up exaggerating an, a, a delivery of arm, arm path, so AKA infielder. So meaning exaggerating, meaning short, really short catcher, really, really short. When your stride length increases, your body and your arm will kind of separate from each other. So you'll kind of what we call find our sweet spot. So by tr- overtraining into that, we know that once we start getting a little aggressive on speed, uh, stride length, pro hop, whatever you might want to do, that if you have already been throwing long in just your old habit catch play, it's just been long. Every drill you do is long. When you add those things I just talked about, they're going to get longer. They're not going to get shorter. They're going to get more aggressive, which is going to help. Uh, is going to hard uh, make timing harder. So we we always kind of talk about like we're gonna we're gonna if it's a shorter throw, we're gonna have a shorter arm action, and as we get further the arm action will naturally kind of get further out. The four pieces that you need to practice and master though, that we're talking about, you're asking me about is just these positions. And the first position, when we, we talk about neutral position, if you, if you held your, if you held your hand on your chest or you held your hand on your belly, depending on if you're maybe infielder or you're a pitcher or outfielder, that's our neutral. That's our starting point. So the first position we ask guys to, to start to master, it's really simple. is just turning your fingers on top, and letting your elbow start to start to go to the throw. So if you're in what we call high pocket, low pocket, infielder high pocket, the first movement is just a turn. That's it. That's all it is. The second movement is the power position, two positions. So all I did is I kept moving from out of the sleeve to this position here. And now if you see from this side, I'm not in, in a scap load at all. I'm just in a float position. So I'm not pulling back or anything here. I'm just holding that position right here. So infielders catchers little quick movement position player our pitchers and outfielders you know and you can probably see it down here i'm just turning to that position so i'm still getting to the two position just from different spots now once i get to the two i'm in a swivel chair so it's kind of easy to, to demo this is that if i don't move my hand so i'm relaxed but i'm moving my hips and i'm starting to turn to rotate to throw now let's see it from this side see as i turn my scap i can feel is loading right now right? So as my hips turn, so I'm not trying to pull it. I'm letting my hips rotate. All I've done is make sure that I'm floating and relaxed in this position. So once I do that, 
that movement now is going to allow it to lay back and then shoot out like a catapult. If I'm in a position, if I haven't mastered that two position, and let's say I'm getting up too high or I'm getting too low and I'm turning my hips, I'm going to have a tougher time laying back and getting that good, good fluid, relaxed throw. If I go up, then I have to come back down, time that, so that's complicated. Or if I'm too aggressive into scat load, I'm not going to get that nice rebound catapult effect. So we spend a lot of time, and really our goal is to get you out of the sleeve, right? The goal is not to use the sleeve. So it's just to sort of kind of like put this imprint image and pattern of how to slow down and allow the timing of the hips. So the sequence goes one, two, three, four, and that's it. And a lot of guys will go one, three, four, you know, they're all, they're all out of sequence. So this is why it's been such a big kind of way of, in the USC just came in and did a big study on this and showed how the uh, pocket path has created less stress and higher performance. That's like the Holy grail. <laughs> like, wow. That is so, congratulations coach. Yeah, that's, and that's so awesome. This month, actually mid March, they're going to have a study printed and, and out. So, so we're excited about that because we want to get to, we want to get to perfect game. We want to get to little league. We want to get to all these huge organizations with young kids that are, you know, they don't really care about how they throw because they can throw from A to B. Problem is, is there's a lot of guys who are athletic who can do it, but they're putting stress on their, on their arm. They just don't know it yet because the distances aren't that big yet. Maybe they haven't thrown enough yet. So we're just trying to like bridge that gap and try to give like just the basics. Like if you just gave, you know, less of the Cobra drills and, all these crazy windmill drills that we, you know, all used to do and used to teach. And you start learning how, wait a minute, that's not what we want to do. We want to do this. And it's sort of like when people ask like, what's the pocket path or what, what is a pocket path? I always say, it's like, you've seen it, you've described it. You just didn't realize it. It's every time you go to a field and you go, Oh man, that kid's arm is, is really smooth or really easy. That's, that's a guy because he's sequenced. Well, like that's what you want right. to do. That's what you want to figure out. And that's amazing. One thing that stands out, you see, uh, you know, a term <laughs> in infield play is follow your throw. And I don't disagree with it. I think, you know, time and place. But the more and more I've dived into studying throwers and it's just crazy. The game is catch and throw and it, it's a, a very, very, very undertaught skill. And yeah. and you and then it becomes harder and harder once you create these sequences and pathways. It's just bringing context, like get back to what throwing from the middle, what an arm action, yeah. what your front side should do. And and like you said, like we understand we got to teach these kids how to use their hips, but it's more just like a timing and sequence. That's that's really what it is, because when you're throwing and you're like on a play that takes four seconds, you're not thinking about your hip. Right. You're just trying to f figure out a sequence. Yeah. Um, but the whole follow thing I come back to, I'll come back to is when we start to get kids to follow their throw, I've just seen so many kids skip two and three and their elbow gets out in front and their right foot's been off the earth for the last split second. So mm -hmm. if we're going to say force is generated through rotation, maybe backside hip, then how much force is coming from my backside if it's following my elbow? Like they're they're working together when they yep. need to work against each other to create uh, resistance towards and trunk rotation. So um, the follow is like, I get that that kid's probably not getting through the ball, but I, I don't know if following your throw is going to help a kid <clears throat> sequence better. I think you need to well, finish your throw. Right. Yeah, actually, the worst uh, group that does – throwing and i think it's exactly what you're just talking about because they overcoach that part are softball girls like softball girls have some of the worst throwing habits because one they start all wacky and crazy but then the second thing is they all like just follow their throw even if it's just a, a throw to start <clears throat> like a 10 foot throw or something um it's always always like that um so they end up lots of elbow pushy throws and so I'm all, I, one of the things I'm working on with softball girls is to learn how to, to actually keep that back leg back, you know, in the beginning, just to, to kind of almost rewind and, and reteach a lot of different things that they're not doing really well. And that's when I'm watching, everyone's different. You got a coach who's ever in front of you, but there's times where I'll have my infielders break, slow down their hand sequence. Hey, mm -hmm. just slow your hand break down. 
or <laughs> speed yeah. your handbrake up depending on where their feet are right so it's yeah. and then they're like oh my god like that throws on plane well i'm like yeah well you're sequenced or yeah. widen your base out so your shoulders hips get on plane um yeah, if, you back know, to, if you know the windows it, it it's it becomes pretty easy to give uh quick easy instruction that will make a lot of sense to somebody and you're right i'll be telling the guy on my left although we're working on the exact same thing yes we're from the pocket i'm saying you slow down you speed up so it's uh it's it's funny that that works oftentimes you know and and the neat part neat part about the arm path is that and i think that's why baseball doesn't kind of like get give it much credit but now obviously things have changed um is that it it doesn't seem on the surface that if you don't really work on it and see it every day, that it would make that big a difference. It makes a huge difference in the whole chain. When that is sequenced up, the lower half completely looks different. Things that you've been working on forever, the glove side, every, all these things just change. And it's just off this, I've seen it so many times in here where somebody has changed just a subtle little timing mechanism on his arm. We have a couple of big leaguers this off season that are, that are really doing well in spring training. And the coaches, the organizations were like, geez, like he's using his lower half so much more. What'd you guys do? You know, we just changed a little small little hand thing and it just, 100%. He, he always had it in. It's just, he needed to time it. So it's kind of cool to see that stuff. I love that. I'm not surprised at all. Um, and part of like the short arm action and stuff like that and not following your throw. I'm like, I'm starting to think about infielders best throw from just a pure backspun velocity ball. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I'm, I'm thinking about, you know, short stops going into the five five hole on a on a on a mm -hmm. on the run backhand, they reposition their feet and they don't follow their throw. Mm -hmm. All they do is rotate their hips and sequence well and the ball gets backspun across yeah. the diamond. That's those are the best throws in my college career. When I went to the five five hole, turn, cleared my front side, short arm action, yeah. ball was backspun for days. I'm sitting there like, why do I want to follow my throw if that thing is going to come out of the hand 90, 95? Like, oh, I don't, uh, I don't you're get nailing, it. So 100%, you're nailing the exact, my, whenever someone's asking me about like, you know, why does infielders, how does an infielder convert to pitcher? And I said, the only throw you got to look at, the one you have to look at the most is that, that play right there, because that is where you can't use momentum. You have to rotate. You don't get to shuffle. You don't get to crow hop. So if you want to look at what a pitcher has to do every single day, hundred times a day, that is exact. He has to do the backhanded throw in the in the hole, the five six hole. That's that's why they throw the way they throw. That's why they can't go just follow their throw, you know. So it's a hundred percent. They all do, even if it's an infield that just tends to kind of get up here and flick the ball, you know, on routine plays. You you put them into that position right there and tell them throw as hard as you can across the diamond. You'll see the pocket path. <laughs> you're saying your T spine, like thoracic extension. You'll see it all. You'll see. You'll see just yes. exactly what the perfect throw should be look like, and how you should be training it, even if it wasn't thrown as hard as you can. You know, like to me, that's what the pocket came because infielders take that ball back and they rip, and you just did describe it yourself, and it was a perfect pocket path, like you just did the exact sequence you're supposed to. It fires me up, and it's like the I use that lane for my throwers who follow everything. Right. Mm -hmm. And I try and just identify like, listen, we want to follow our throw when we've, when we've built up a lot of momentum that we want to sustain going glove side. Like, yes, we want to figure out your hands have to speed up to allow your feet and your momentum continue. Your slots going to change. It's going to be lower working uphill, but if you're going to your right, there's a still, there's a lot of momentum. It's just different. It's repositioned through rotation, not, you moving your feet towards your target it's a different type of transfer well, it's efficiency right it's yes it's, um, as a pitcher you have to be as efficient as you can I mean, that's just the way you're supposed to think about it and if you take that play that you're talking about you have to be so perfect with everything because you don't get the advantages of a crow hop of a shuffle throw or whatever so you have to figure out your body has to figure out how can i throw this as far as i have to, i mean that is the furthest throw on the diamond I have to throw it as hard as I can and I have to be as accurate as I can. If I can't do that play, I better be a good DH or I better be an outfield. <laughs> That's it. That's, <laughs> and that the last part of that, the, somewhere within that equation is like, if you don't load, understand how to gather and go your backside hip on that play, you're already into your front side hip. Think of like a change up, you leak out in front. You can't, you, there's no breaking force for your front pelvis to clear to allow your back hip to accelerate. Like, Man, we could talk. We got to have a podcast on that lane only. Yeah. I, I, I well, love that. You know, there, there's a few truth tellers uh, in baseball 
and uh, I, I use it for football. Football, throwing a football is a truth teller. You know, you can't you can't hide from that. So guys who have crappy arm actions usually have terrible throws. And then that throw right there is my my other truth teller. So those two throws for pitchers, those are the two ones that if you're going to grow up as a, you know, a parent with a kid, you you get those two throws, a football and that backhand ball in the hole as your kid's best throws. <laughs> that that's hey we just gotta like create a kid who could throw overhead sure great but move like once we start to develop tools like i'm gonna make sure he could throw in that lane and then on the run like he's got to be able to mm-hmm. so those two things if he understands the principles of throwing on the run off his front right left hip great i'll figure out the hands part yeah and that throw and then well and then i think the on the run is just a progression if you were regressed it's going glove side uh lower slot uphill to sustain momentum that's an awesome, like I get fired up because we spend a lot of time on throwing, man. I think mm-hmm. it's uh, super important. We do a lot of dynamic stuff, a lot of rhythmic stuff, understanding where your right foot is with your hand break. Um, and there's a lot of rotation you have to control. And then a lot of window development, stuff like that. Um, you're, just, you're, just helping, you're just helping me look really good as a pitcher, a pitching coach, because uh, if they somehow stop hitting the fastball and they decide, hey, I got to go on the mound. <laughs> And they've been doing all the They're things. They're going right up there to PFA. I and got I'm you. Like, I'll send a like, shot. I don't have to do a whole lot. That's my whole point. I'm trying <laughs> to make all these pitchers into re- in, into infielders. <laughs> and you're making these infielders perfect. So I, I they can be a pitcher. Out, and that's easy. So we'll get great. a nice uh, dig it shuttle to PFA. Right. Um, Coach, let's, let's wrap this up a little bit. What do you think the lowest hanging fruit is for a youth infielder or a father just to help out as a thrower? But outside of – dude, I, I'll answer that in my own question by the pocket path. Go by yeah. the pocket path. It's it one of those tools, like we use trainers, like, and I don't have to coach a kid. I could put on a trainer and if it, yeah. you, you're not playing underneath the ball, you're not playing through the ball, yada, yada, yada. Mm-hmm. This is one of those things for every single softball and baseball player, right? Everyone throws a, a, a baseball or softball. This is the foundation nucleus. Yeah. You figure out where the game's telling you have flaws. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's where I go constantly to different practices and, drive by fields and I'll see, you know, 20 kids out there warming up, playing catch. And I'll, I always say, it's like, I'll, I'll see, you know, 10 kids that needed this thing two years ago, five years ago. And I'll see five that don't realize that it will help them. And then five that are fine. They're perfect. Good job. You know? And that's a big chunk. That's a <laughs> 15 lot. Out of 20 kids. And it, and it truly is. If you watch, if you go to a practice and, you just pick a park today and drive to it and watch practice. You will see some of the worst throwing habits, uh, mechanics, uh, results that you'll ever see. And it's because there haven't been given a nucleus, like you said, or a foundation to start from that's simple that you don't have to be there to teach it. And that's why we made it because you teach a kid one thing and you'll see him the next week and you go, man, have we ever met? Like, <laughs> like, what did you do this week? Oh, they didn't practice it. They forgot it, you know, but you give them this tool. They have a constraint that can be a great visual. There's even big league pitchers that will text me in the mate in a major league game in a, in a game when you're not supposed to be thinking that will say, Dave, you know what, man, I, I was in the jam and I, you know what I did? I just pretend like I had the pocket path on like we did in the off season. And I just got love it. things up and I went, that's funny. I mean, that's a, let's go. <laughs> that's that's firing me up. I don't even know who I uh, never, like I never met that guy. Um, so I, I think that's amazing. I also, back to your point, watching other people throw, you throw, well, how is their coach throwing? How's their father and mother coach throwing? Like yep. the kids are very, they mimic, they, they, they absorb, mimic. they listen, but who they listen to, what are they doing? So I think that's huge. Just, yep. Hey, if you're a dad, you're, you're a mom and you don't know your lane, it's okay. It's fine. Get something, put tools in front of them to help minimize how far they can get off the beaten path. So where could we buy this? Is it just pocketpath.com? That's the best place. Pocketpath.com. And you got uh, youth shirt ones. You got the belt version. I think the belt version is the most universal one because you can really grow with it. Um, and it'll give you two plyo balls with it. And we have a great new throwing system that we're starting where you'll learn to throw one inside the sleeve, immediately take the next ball out of the sleeve. So you're throwing two at a time. Um, and this is kind of adopted from infielders and from softball. Because the, the transition is that when you go through the sleeve, you're guided. And if you take the ball and you throw from out of the sleeve and it feels different, you'll instantly feel it and you'll make a quick adjustment. So it's a really good tool to be able to do the two-throw throwing system that we have now. 
and we can even do it with baseballs. We have all our youth teams doing this where they have two baseballs out there playing catch. So they're getting double the reps in catch play. So there's not a lot of wasted time. You know, usually catch play is so rushed and, and it's literally the most important part of the day for a baseball player, but it's usually the most uncoached, unwatched and rushed through part of the day. So to maximize that, what we have our kids do is wear the sleeve, ball in the glove, ball in the hand. First one goes from the sleeve, throw. Next one, take it out of the glove and throw. So they're trying to mimic these two throws to try to get these to pattern up and be exactly the same. So that's been a really, that, that thing has been awesome to watch. That's, that's probably sped up double the time of kids learning how to throw better. Just that. the motor skill, the in, constant feedback from the CNS. Like if your first throw stunk, then you can fix it. If your first throw was amazing, then you can repeat it. Right. And the ball gives you feedback. So that's amazing. Um, we, we, I've, I've been able to use that with several of my infielders and it's been just incredible. The, the feedback and the feel is real, right? Like drills, build skills type thing. This is no gimmick. This isn't something you're going to buy and never use it again. You'll use it forever. The resync to learn. So yes. absolutely amazing coach. Where else can these, uh, the listeners find you? Where do you uh, got yeah. most of your content? Yeah. Instagram. I'm on Instagram, uh, two different places, pocket path, Instagram, uh, you can look that up. And then on Dave Coggin PFA on, on Instagram. Um, and then on Twitter, uh, path pocket or pocket path. It's a weird pocket path was taken. So somehow it switched it, but you can find me at those places. Awesome. Coach Dave Coggins. Thank you so much for coming on. There's a bunch of nuggets in this episode. Thank you. And we'll have you on again soon.